All right, today we're here to discuss the H-E-N-T exam, which stands for Head, Eyes, Ears, Nose, and Throat. We have with us Mr. Mike Hemingway, who has agreed to uh, participate in this exam. Uh, regardless of whether or not the student has come into the room and washed their hands first before they've greeted you, they should always wash their hands before they do the physical exam, so let's wash our hands. Uh, they can either use the uh, antibacterial soap that's provided or the Purell that's available. If they use soap, they have been taught to wash their hands for about 30 seconds, which is the time it takes to say the ABCs. Now, if you hear them singing ABC songs over in the corner, uh, don't think they've lost their minds. They're just practicing what we, we told them to. Hopefully, they'll say their ABCs to themselves. Um, but that takes about 30 seconds to wash your hands, and that's been proved to be enough time to... Uh, to adequ adequately wash and clean your hands. They should have already introduced themselves to the patients, but uh, the proper introduction is Mr. Hemingway, I'm Steve Williams. I'm a first year medical student at uh, Mercer University School of Medicine. It's a pleasure to meet you. You too, sir. Um, today we're going to do an exam on your head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat. And uh, as I go through the exam, I'll explain what I'm doing. And uh, if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, we'll start out by observing the head. What we're looking for in the observation of the head is relative size and shape to the body. Uh, we're also looking for symmetry of facial features. So if we just look at Mr. Hemingway's head, we notice that he's got a normal shaped head. It's uh, more elongated than it is round. It uh, is more elongated than it is square shaped. Uh, we also notice the symmetry. Uh, both eyes are on the same plane. One is not set back further than the other. This is important from an embryological development standpoint. We notice that his nose is normal shaped and sized. There is no flaring of the ally nasi, so he's not in, having any respiratory problems. We also notice that the nose is midline, doesn't appear to have been broken or anything. So uh, the observation of the head is looking good. We notice that if we look at his eyes, there is adequate space for one more eye between the two, which is normal. That's what it should be like. if the eyes were further spaced apart than that, that would be abnormal. If they were closer together, that would be abnormal. I can get you to turn your head slightly. We also notice if we look at the epicanthal fold, which is the corner of the eye, and we draw a line straight back, the top of his ear is above that. That's a normal finding. If the top of his ear would, were below that, that might correspond to some neurologic abnormalities. Okay, thank you. The next thing that we're going to do is palpate the uh, scalp and look for any evidence of trauma. We'll be feeling for bruises, bumps, lumps, or any signs of infections. Uh, we'll also be looking at the hair and f noticing the color and the texture. Um, I generally start at the back and just gently palpate. And I don't feel any subcutaneous lesions along the scalp. Don't feel any areas of infection. 
The hair feels fine, not brittle. And I didn't feel any muscle wasting or anything of that nature to make me concerned about uh, chronic diseases. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is move into the eye exam now that we've completed uh, the general head exam. When we start with the eye exam, we're going to start with the external exam. We've already begun that exam just by observation that the eyes were set reasonably apart. The next thing we're going to do is notice that the sclera or the white part of the eye are in fact white. Uh, they're not blue, they're not yellow. Uh, which would indicate other disease problems. We notice that the irises are bluish green. Uh, the pupils, which are the center of the eye, are dark as they should be. There are no flecks or abnormal rings in the irises. Um, the next thing we're going to do is look at the conjunctiva. Uh, and we do this by pulling down on the lower lid and look at the white area of the inner eyelid. We notice that there is some redness to the inner eyelid, but that is not abnormal. Uh, if it were infected or there were an allergy, it would be quite bright red, would have a lot more blood vessels involved, and there might be blood vessels moving up along into the sclera. The next thing we're going to do is check for extraocular eye movements. Now there are two manners that we can do this. One is called the H-type, the other is the X-type. We'll demonstrate the H-type first where we ask the patient to look at our fingers and without moving your head follow our fingers. So we move in one direction parallel up down, come back to the center, come across, up, down. Then there is the X type where we start in the center, move in one direction, come down to the other, back to the center, down to the other, then out. This checks the cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, and so we notice that all of his eye movements were normal. The next thing that we're going to check is cranial nerve 2, which checks for our optic nerve function, and we do this by looking at pupillary constriction. Now, normally what we would do is we would have the room darkened so that we could see the pupils better because as the room is darkened the pupils are going to dilate. Since we're taping this and we need all the light we can get, we're not going to turn down the light, but I'll just describe what we're going to do. We're going to use our ophthalmoscope and if you can see here, there's a light on my hand and we can see this. We're going to ask the patient to stare straight ahead and I'm going to shine the light initially in his right eye and observe his right eye and what we would normally see is constriction of that right pupil. That's the direct response for the pupil. We're going to repeat that same maneuver shining the light in the right pupil but this time I'm watching the left pupil that would be the consensual response of the left pupil. We should see it dilate as well. Then we're going to repeat this same exercise on the left side, shining the light in the left pupil, watching that pupil constrict. That would be the direct response. We'll give the, time, the eye time to reaccommodate. Then we'll shine the light in that left eye again, but this time observing the right eye and watching it constrict. Now, should there be a discrepancy between the two, it just need be noted. 
The next thing that we're going to do is a fundoscopic exam uh, for medical students. This is probably the hardest part of the physical exam that they have to learn. Uh, it is a difficult technique. It takes years and years and years of practice. Um, so uh, on this first exam, we really don't expect all of them to get this uh, precisely correct. But there are a few things that we want you to notice uh, while they're doing this exam. One is we don't want them starting three feet away. We want them starting about a foot and a half away. Two, when they're examining your eye and they're moving from this distance to this distance, you should notice a change in power of the ophthalmoscope as they change the diopters that they're using to focus on the back part of your eye or the retina. If they simply move from a foot and a half away to your eye, which would be six to eight inches away, and they don't change the power of the ophthalmoscope, the likelihood of them finding anything is really unusually rare. So we should be listening for the change in the diopters of the scope. So again, in order to do this exam appropriately, the lights need to be off. The gooseneck lamp, which is behind the patient, needs to be on just to cast, cast a little ambient light. Patient needs to be uh, asked to stare at st something straight ahead on the wall so that they're not focusing on your light. So Mr. Hemingway, if you'll find a spot on the wall straight ahead to focus on, we're going to start on the right side and when we do the right eye we use our right eye. We start back here and I notice the red reflex which is what we want to do and then we move in focusing on the retina. I can actually see his vessels. They're, they're, they're small. Because of the size of the pupil it's very difficult to see get in to see the disc. Um, then we're going to move to the left side. Now this is the more difficult side, at least for me and, and most others, since most of us are right hand dominant. We're going to use our left hand and this prevents us from bumping noses, kissing the patient, And I'm getting a glance at vessels, not the disc. And that's about all I can see in this light since the pupils aren't dilated very much. Now, if the student were to ask you to look at the light, they are trying to visualize the macula that should be very painful for you. If they tell you they saw the macula, that should also be very painful for you. If it's not painful, uh, then they probably have not seen the macula because that is the area of the most sensitive of our retina and it, it is painful when direct light is shined on it. The next thing we're going to do is move on to the otoscopic exam and to do that we're going to use an otoscope and this is an otoscope. Notice that it's different from the ophthalmoscope. Always check to make sure the light is on. One of the problems that students have with otoscopes is that they tend to put the speculum on and not attach it. When you put the speculum on, you have to twist it to lock it in place. 
it will not come off. But you'll notice that in a lot of our novice students, when they take the otoscope away from their ear, your ear, they will leave the tip behind. And one of the most crucial things that we do when we examine the ear is we brace. In other words, we put our hands in such a fashion that should the patient move, uh, we move with them. In order to do an appropriate uh, ear exam, the ear has to be pulled back and up. Now, as a pediatrician, I was taught to brace against the temporal part of the head. And here again, I am looking at a clear tympanic membrane. I can see the light reflex. I can see the, the bones behind the tympanic membrane in the middle ear. And we move that. Most adults, when they're taught to do a uh, bracing technique, brace against the side of the face. Like so. And Mr. Hemingway, can you tell that I'm braced? I can. Okay, if you will move. Okay, did you feel anything in your ear? No pain, no discomfort. Okay. The reason for that bracing is so that when he moves, I move with him. Uh, if you were to scratch the inside of the ear canal, that's a very painful and sensitive area of the body, and it's something we want to avoid. In the past, we have had students uh, not brace properly and... Uh, DSPs sneeze or cough during the process and have actually injured the internal ear canal. So please be uh, wary of the bracing and students should uh, be, uh, receive feedback if in fact they don't brace during that period of time. Again on the left side we pull the ear up and back Looks like my light went out. And we've got virtually the same exam on this side. That's the technique for bracing on that side. And the technique for bracing on this side. Okay, now that we've completed the otoscopic exam, we're going to move to the nasal exam. We're going to discard the speculum that we used for the ear exam. And we're going to use a new speculum for the nasal exam. Now one caveat to remember in the ear exam is had one of those ears been infected we would have then removed the speculum and changed it for a new one uh, before we looked in the opposite ear. This applies also applies to the nose if we examine one aspect of the nose that has a mucopurulent discharge we change the speculum before we go to the other side of the nose. In order to properly examine the nose, we ask the patient to tilt their head about 45 degrees toward the ceiling. We insert the speculum on the lateral side of the nair to avoid the nasal septum. What we observe is pink mucous membranes, no boggy erythematous purple membranes, no polyps. We do that on the right side, then we move to the left side, again staying lateral. 
lost my light source. This is a very sensitive otoscope. And we see the same thing. So there's been no discharge. Once we do that, we discard the speculum. Never leave a speculum on the, uh, the instrument that you're using. If you walk into a room and there's a speculum on the otoscope, discard that speculum and put a new one on. The next thing we're going to do is uh, evaluate the mouth. Uh, I evaluate the mouth by removing the uh, well this one's not going to allow me to do that so I'm going to use a different light source. I'm going to use a pen light uh, and so some otoscopes you're allowed to take the otoscope head off converting the otoscope into a larger flashlight. Uh, since that otoscope won't allow us to do that, we'll use this pen light as our source of flashlights. If you're going to examine a patient's mouth, it's like going into a cave, you need a, a light source. So always use a light source when you're examining a patient's mouth. Always use a tongue blade. Now, the tongue blade is to examine the throat so that we do not gag the patient, but we just simply depress the tongue. So I'm going to ask Mr. Hemingway to open wide, say ah. Ah. All right, and what we see here is a clear pharynx, a uvula that is midline, which is a structure that hangs down from the uh, soft palate. Uh, we see no erythema, we see no pus, so we have a clear pharynx without pus or exudates. Um, to continue the mouth exam, I'm ask him to open again. We look at the buccal mucosa along each side of the cheek, under the tongue, Look at the dentition. Look at the hard palate. We don't see any abnormalities in the hard palate. The dentition has uh, some caps and fillings. And then to complete the mouth exam, we're going to fully inspect the mouth. So I'm going to ask him to smile so that we can evaluate his teeth and his bite and I'm going to ask you to relax. I'm going to pull down on his lower lip. What we're looking for here is evidence of damage from uh, potential uh, tobacco use. Then we're going to palpate this lower gum line. Feeling for tenderness, looseness, We're going to palpate the upper gum line, again feeling for the same thing. We're going to look at the upper gum line for the same thing. We're going to ask him to open wide and lift his tongue. We're going to palpate here for lumps, bumps, and anything that would be sublingual. We're going to palpate along the inside of the buccal mucosa. We're going to ask him to bite down hard. Any pain? No pain. Okay. Now that we've completed the mouth exam, we will move on to the neck exam. What we will look at with the neck at first is general observation. What we're looking for is to see if there are any abnormal swellings or abnormal areas of masses. We don't see any. Uh, so we move on to palpation of the neck. With palpation of the neck, we're looking for uh, thyroid conditions. There are two ways to palpate the neck uh, or the thyroid. One is to move anteriorly, 
and have the patient swallow. Okay. The other is to move posteriorly, and this is the way Dr. Gerald has instructed the students to uh, examine the thyroid and swallow. Okay. The next thing that we're going to do is palpate for anterior cervical nodes and posterior cervical nodes. Anterior cervical nodes lie al along this area in front of this muscle band. And I don't feel any anterior cervical nodes or supraclavicular nodes being over the top of the clavicle. And we'll go behind this muscle band and I don't palpate any posterior uh, lymph nodes. So this concludes our evaluation of the head, eye, ear, nose, and throat exam. Mr. Hemingway, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. My name is Chris Kiker. I'm a first year medical student here at Mercer. Uh, today I'm going to do the head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat exam on you. So I'm going to wash my hands and I'll be right back with you. All right. If I can get the glasses from you. Sure. I'm going to start by doing a head exam. I'm going to feel for any lumps or lesions and just tell me if anything's painful. I'm examining your hair as well. Have you had any head trauma? No, sir. Okay. Now I'm going to examine your eyes and ears. Um, just looking for their symmetry, placement on your head. Everything looks great. You have any sinus problems? No, sir. Okay. All right. So now I'm gonna um, move into the eye exam. I'm gonna start with the external eye exam. So I'm gonna look for any abnormal redness, pussiness. Um, do you have any problems with your eyes? No, sir. Okay. All right. So now I'm gonna turn the the lights off and uh, do a, f a few more procedures on your eyes. All right, I'm gonna measure your extraocular movement so if I can get you to just follow my fingers with your eyes. Okay. Hold your head still for okay. me. And I'm checking for your cranial nerves three, four, and six here. Everything looks great. Now I'm gonna check your pupillary response. So just look straight ahead for me. And I'm just making sure that your pupil constricts on both sides equally. Perfect. Now I'm going to look into your eye. Just look at straight ahead for me. All right, look at me. Perfect. Same thing on this side. All right, look at me. Perfect. Your eyes look good. And you said you haven't had any eye problems? No, sir. All right, let me turn the light back on. Right, now I'm going to examine your ear, look inside at your eardrum. Perfect. Do you have any uh, hearing problems? I've got some hearing loss. Is it in both ears? Yes, sir. Has that got worse as you've gotten older? Yes, it has. Have you looked into hearing aids? I have hearing aids. You do? I just didn't just wear them today because right. I figured you'd be looking. You didn't want to listen to me. That's no? right. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to look into your nose. And you said you don't have any sinus problems? No, sir. All right. All right. Everything looks good there. No redness. So now I'm going to move him to the mouth exam. Oh. 
Get you to open wide for me. All right, and say ah. Ah. Uh -huh. Perfect. Do you chew tobacco or anything? No, I don't. Do you smoke cigarettes? I haven't in 45 years. All right. I'm going to put on some gloves and fill around your mouth for a minute. Do you have any abnormal lesions or any pain when you brush your teeth? No, I sure don't. Okay. I get you to open wide again. And tell me if you feel any pain. Get you to, there you are. And poke your tongue out for me. All right. Everything looks good. All right, so now I'm going to examine your neck uh, yeah, and tell me if you feel any pain. You don't have any lumps or lesions on your neck, do you? Not that I'm aware of. All right. Get you to swallow for me. Fill in your thyroid there. All right, you look good. From my point of view, everything looks good. I'm going to go talk to my attending physician, and they'll be back in here to talk with you shortly. Okay. Pleasure meeting you, sir. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. It's mine. Thank you.